Hi guys, it is a dreary, gloomy, hopefully soon to be rainy Easter Sunday here in the end times of South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Sunday, April 20th, 2014, 420 Easter Sunday. And I am doing, while all the little kitties are out hunting down their Easter eggs, your old doomsday preacher is doing what he always does. Unfortunately, not from my rocky pulpit, because I no longer have a tripod. But anywho, I am here under the Bodhi tree bringing you this week's <clears throat> Doomsday Sermon where I bring to you the latest Bible of the Apocalypse that I have stumbled upon in the Austin City Library just detailing some aspect of the collapse of global industrial civilization and this is this little book Never heard of it before by my fellow Doomsday Prophet, James Howard Kuntzler. And his book, The City in Mind, Notes on the Urban Condition. And this is where Mr. Kuntzler headed out uh, visiting, oh, a dozen or so various cities across the U.S. and the planet looking at the urban condition at the dawn of the 21st century making some predictions about what you can expect to see happening in global society as all of these mega cities uh, ramp up all over this planet and so let me just dive right into it I'm gonna touch on just three cities my hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. Then we're going to go to Las Vegas, Nevada and end up there in the hellhole of Mexico City. So what does uh, he plan to do in this book? <clears throat> this book does not pretend to be the last word on cities. There are plenty of good books on that subject, which is as broad as civilization itself. But I wrote this one at a time when my own culture could not be more confused about the nature and meaning of cities and city life. My modest aim here is to redirect what has amounted in recent times to a pretty incoherent national discussion about how we live and to discern what kinds of choices and predicaments the future may present to us. <clears throat> America at the turn of the millennium <clears throat> is suffering the woeful consequences largely unanticipated of trying to become a drive-in utopia. The attempt took roughly 80 years from the end of the First World War to the brink of global warming, oil depletion, and other epical disorders now hard upon us. This nation's massive suburban build-out was an orgy of misspent energy and material resource, resources that squandered our national wealth and left us with an infrastructure of daily life that, left as is, has poor prospects in the new century. It is hard to overstate the cultural destruction that was once one of its chief side effects, especially the loss of knowledge, tradition, skill, custom, and vernacular wisdom in the art of city making that was thrown into the dumpster of history in our effort to fulfill General Motors' world of tomorrow. 
There you go. And with that, he launches in to his romp around the cities of the dawn of the 21st century. And um, here he is uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was born and lived the first 23 years of my life before fleeing for my life in 1983. And here is the reasons why I fled Atlanta. For you statistic hounds out there, here are some facts about life in Atlanta express the way America likes to get all of its information in numbers. <clears throat> now this was Atlanta right after I left. Each week, roughly 500 acres of raw land in the Atlanta metro region and its fringes are bulldozed for new suburban development. The metro area lost 190,000 acres of tree cover from 1988 to 1998. There were, in 1998, two and a half million motor vehicles registered in Atlanta. Each day, motorists rack up over 100 million vehicle miles on Atlanta's roads and highways. The average commute reached 35 miles per day, which was half again greater than the figure for commuters in LA. The summer that the Mall of Georgia opened, highway signs urged commuters to eat lunch at their desks. There you go. And going hand in hand, the Atlanta metro area's population density is the lowest of all U.S. cities. I grew up in a house six miles from downtown Atlanta on an acre of land. All right. Growth of the suburbs was 100 times greater than growth in the city in 1999. The region's population has grown 70% since 1980. And he's talking about uh, the, the completely embarrassment of the urban core of Atlanta, which has pretty much been abandoned by white people and more and more by any black person who can get the hell out of downtown Atlanta, leaving, uh, leaving these statistics. At the turn of the millennium, one-third of the region's African Americans still lived in the city center along with 6.3% of whites. The poverty rate for the entire metro region was 7.9% and in the central city it was 25%. And this goes on and on, these dreary statistics. So what is uh, the prognosis that James Howard Kunstler has for Atlanta, Georgia. I started this chapter by asking the question, does Edge City have a future? My answer is a plain no. In Atlanta, Georgia, they are constructing a giant misbegotten organism that will almost certainly not be able to function far into the future. Suburbia, more than being a set of things, might be described more accurately as a set of behaviors. They were behaviors made possible only under the extremely abnormal conditions of late 
20th century life in the USA, unprecedented political and economic stability, extraordinary immunity to the consequences of bad decisions, otherwise known as the ability to mortgage the present against the future, and cheap oil, cheap oil, cheap oil. All these things are apt to change in the years directly ahead. In the public debates about suburbia, the idea is almost always put forward that suburbia exists because Americas like it and want it. That may have been so, but if so, it may have been a poor choice. What's more, that people like a way of living or are accustomed to certain behavior does not mean that circumstances will necessarily allow them to continue that way of living. Junkies like their heroin too, but after a while their veins collapse, their immune systems switch off, and their organs begin to shut down. I am convinced that circumstances in the 21st century will compel us to live very differently. The next economy will be the repo economy. And he goes in there uh, talking about the collapse of cities all over America uh, due to the economic collapse and peak oil and the usual uh, the usual suspects. I see the unwinding of credit and presumed wealth evolving into a tremendous political fight over the table scraps of the cheap oil economy and the dubious material artifacts it produced pitting neighbor against neighbor, group against group, and region against region. I believe that the world is entering a long era of chronic instability in oil markets that no amount of wishing or pretending will hold back. We Americans cherish a set of delusions to minimize or or deflect the seriousness of our situation. As already touched on, we believe that we can run a drive-in civilization on some fuel other than petroleum. The actual prospects for this are dim, but we base our belief, a wish really, on the spectacular cavalcade of technological achievements that occurred in the previous century. And uh, then he goes, uh, you, you know, in talking about anyone who believes this unadulterated horseshit that these renewable alternative energies are going to be able to pull global civilization out of its tailspin, pull your head out of your ass. I like this one. The Caesar salad that travels 2,500 miles from California to somebody's table in Atlanta will become an object of nostalgia. You know, half a million products from medicine, asphalt, paint, 
and detergent to plastic trash bags are derived from oil. The fact is that we are an oil-based economy. And how does all of this play in to what's going to be happening in Atlanta? Uh, in my view, Atlanta, Georgia has become such a mess that really nothing can be done to redeem it as a human habitat like the other great roaring car-dependent megalopoli of the American Sun Belt, Atlanta's only plausible destiny at the threshold of the new millennium is to become significantly depopulated. There you go. And from there he goes to a city I have never been to Las Vegas, Nevada. All right, this is his uh, state of affairs of Las Vegas at the dawn of the 21st century. To say that Antarctica is the worst place on, they say that Antarctica is the worst place on Earth, but I believe that distinction belongs to Las Vegas, hands down. For one thing, Antarctica is more pleasing to look at. And the population of Antarctica, though tiny in comparison, is better educated, less transient, and employed in more honorable work. Las Vegas certainly leads in cheap buffets but the result is a shocking rate of obesity with attendant medical disorders. Some might even argue that overall Antarctica has better weather. In Las Vegas, a baby left unattended in the back seat of a car for nine minutes will fricassee before its mother returns with the dry cleaning. As I write this, Las Vegas is the fastest growing city in the U.S. For a culture that understand things, understands things only in terms of numbers, this supposedly proves that it must be a splendid place. I've heard it touted often as the American city of the future, the prototype habitat for a society in which the old boundaries between work, leisure, entertainment, information, production, service, and acquisition dissolve and a new, exciting, colorful, pleasure-laden human meta-existence finds material expression in any wishful forms of the imagination. Blah, blah, blah. And if Las Vegas truly is our city of the future, then we might as well all cut our own throats tomorrow. I certainly feel like cutting mine after spending only a few days there. So overwhelming was the sheer enemy provoked by every particular of its design and operation. As a city, it is a futureless catastrophe. As a tourist trap, it is a meta joke. As a theosophical matter, it presents proof that we are a wicked people who deserve to be punished. In the historical context, Las Vegas is the place where America's 
spirit crawled off to die. The trouble with Las Vegas is not just that it is ridiculous and dysfunctional, but that anybody might take seriously a model uh, for human ecology on anything but the most extreme provisional terms. That they do might in itself be proof that American civic culture has now reached terminal stage. Even the casual observer can see that Las Vegas is approaching its own tipping point as a viable urban system, particularly in the matter of scale. This is the predicament of Las Vegas. Its components have attained a physical enormity that will leave them vulnerable to political, economic, and social changes that are bearing down upon us with all the inexorable force of history. Las Vegas has evolved as a crude extrapolation of several elements of modern American culture. The defiance of nature, abnormally cheap land, vast empty space for expansion, and the belief that it is possible to get something for nothing. These elements all presenting themselves there in the most extreme form. The trouble with extrapolation as a growth model is that it assumes the continuation of all present conditions in the future only more so. But since this is not consistent with how the world works, systems organized on this basis fail. Anyway, to extrapolate urban growth based only on extreme conditions invites certain catastrophe, since the law of unintended consequences will produce ever more compounded skewed outcome, outcomes. The destiny of Las Vegas, therefore, would seem bright in the same sense that a thermonuclear explosion is bright. I view it as a model for the extinction of the system I call the National Automobile Slum. And jumping to the end of this chapter, it is really impossible anymore to imagine a happy future for this dubious urbanoid organism. To the casual observer, Las Vegas has used up its future like the profligate young heir to a fantastic fortune. Oh boy. Uh, the pretensions of the kitsch lovers aside, there was never anything innocent about Las Vegas. It has always been a product of the purest cynicism, real gangster cynicism, cynicism headless corpse in the desert cynicism. The city's current condition might be viewed as the end product of an unprecedented half-century bonanza of cheap petroleum economy and the circumstances of relative world peace. Anyway, 
We are about to leave the cheap oil era behind and all the wishful thinking from sea to shining sea will not summon up a plausible reason to think that we comprehend the territory ahead of us. To me, the most plausible future for Las Vegas is a ghost town an atomic age te Otawakan viewed, say, 200 years from now, a scene of silent desolation, the ancient strip empty of cars, the once lush medians devoid of palm trees, the Bellagio fabled lake, a cracked concrete shell with the plumbing long stripped by salvage scavengers, the great hotel's concrete skeletons, their spray-on stucco long since granulated under the relentless ultraviolet rays, the casinos gutted, here and there a tarantula, a buzzard, a rat. The excitement over. And uh, we're going uh, to take one peek a little south of the border to another city I have never been to in my life and never will be called Mexico City. And uh, this is his uh, visit to Mexico City at the turn of the 21st century. It was the rainy season, but the rains had not come in this super El Nino year. Forest fires raged out of control south of the city and the air pollution approached supernatural levels. At ground level, the ozone concentrations exceeded the national safety standard by 200% and trees were dying in Chapel Tepec Park. Flying into the airport over the rugged rim of mountaintops that enclose the enormous basin like an ancient fortification, you saw the city smoldering below like a gigantic ashtray. It is believed that there may be as many as 30 million people now living in the old valley of Mexico as this now thoroughly urbanized basin is called, but nobody really knows. The experts as the University of Mexico don't know, they can only guess. The population has become a great mysterious shape-shifting god that expresses itself in conditions as different as the appalling low-rise slum of Chalco in the dried-up lake bed of the same name and the new luxury high-rise condominiums of the Santa Fe suburbs. The organism is too big and restless for its constituent cells to be counted. The un, these unknowable, uncountable, unquantifiable issues of measurement in a place where not even the ground is solid do not alter what is visible and palpable in this fearsome metropolis that it is in a state of crisis verging on breakdown. The government pretends to govern. Public safety is a joke 
the quality of life is unpleasant for the well-off and atrocious for the vastly more numerous poor. The air is lethal. The water is septic. Human waste has nowhere to go. Epidemics erupt with medieval virulence. Automobile traffic is stupendous and horribly corrosive of public life. Trash lies scattered even in the best neighborhoods and the streets smell badly everywhere. A major earthquake could happen at any time like it did three days ago. A seven and a half quake about a hundred miles away and even the nearby volcano has stirred in recent years, insidiously venting poison gases into slums that suffer every other conceivable ill to which human settlements are prone. If limits to human growth are comprehensible, then Mexico City presents them in terms that are starkly obvious. There you go. I think that pretty much sums up and we will leave this rant in the slum of Chaco, which he uh, mentioned, which uh, according to Doomsday Prophet, James Howard Kunstler, the slum of Chalco in Mexico City. If you want to see where this planet is headed to in the 21st century, he invites you to the slum of Chalco. The old dried up bed of Lake Chalco, 15 miles east of the city center, is the site of Mexico's newest giant slum, which has graduated over the decades from a hellhole <coughs> to a more complexly organized peasant barrio. Jesus. Uh, in the late 1990s, Chalco was said to contain a population of two and a half million people in this one slum, but it was another one of those phantom statistics that no one could verify. If anything, the slum is growing steadily larger every day like a great exurban tumor. The economy of rural Mexico had become so hopeless that even Chalco was a step up for the newcomers who flocked in every hour from the desert or jungle hinterlands. As a physical artifact, Chalco had the character of an immense junkyard laid out incongruously over a highly regular orthogonal urban grid. And uh, this, go, th th this goes on, uh, on and on. You could look up the very straight streets for a mile and see not a single object that was not broken, twisted, rusted, cracked, bent, corroded, leaning, tattered, or shot up. The majority of houses had dirt floors, and in the rainy season, they became fetid, muddy cesspools. The periodic but unpredictable venting of volcanic gases only made things 
worse. The public health consequences were overwhelming. Practically everyone there suffered from chronic infections, airborne parasites, and fungal skin disorders. Cholera broke out at regular intervals. The leading cause of death, however, was violence, followed by the effects of chronic alcoholism and drug abuse. Feral-looking children teamed in the dusty, unpaved streets, hurling rocks at an inexhaustible supply of panting skeletal dogs while impassive adults in shredded clothing sat here and there on overturned plastic buckets, stuporously surveying the scene. And that is what uh, he found on his first uh, visit to the uh, to Mexico City and this is uh, I guess his look into the future to close out this rant. Chalco had formed this way in a mere decade. It I guess had become the kind of place that even well-intentioned unselfish educated, idealistic Mexican progressives regarded with dread as though they were looking into an occult window into their nation's grim future, as palpable to them as the end of the universe was to their Aztec ancestors. A constant tremor seemed to run through the body politic at all levels. It accompanied the frightful recognition that a tipping point had been reached in Mexico City's ability to continue as a viable collective organism. The crime, the pollution, the poverty, the drug abuse, the misery, the decay, the distrust and treachery, the prospective scarcity of civilization's goods and graces gave every evidence of climbing further up a cataclysmic curve in the years ahead. And, of course, one lived in this part of the world with the knowledge that it has happened many times before. That cities every bit as important as modern-day Mexico City in their own terms and epochs have vanished into the silence of history leaving behind only their mute stone skeletons. And there you go. Leave it to uh, my fellow Doomsday Prophet, James Howard Kunstler, to bum you out on Easter Sunday in the City in Mind Notes on the Urban Condition. And uh, I have my own urban condition to deal with here in Austin, Texas. But right now, it is starting to rain, I'm glad to see. So I need to prepare for the oncoming severe thunderstorms. Bring them on! Happy Easter! Bye, guys.